okay guys, uh, I'm here to talk about some of our products and uh, first of all I would like to explain my eye a little bit. <laughs> I got some uh, draft in my eye and uh, because of that I, I, I got a slight eye infection so I look maybe a little bit red but uh, it doesn't stop my brain from working so I will now <laughs> talk a little bit about our, our, some of our products. And the first one I want to talk about is our SD880, which is a streamer and a DAC. And uh, in the earlier uh, types of our products, we always separated things because that allows us to get a better power supply, uh, more noise reduction into our products. Here we have actually fused two products together, and a streamer and a DAC. And the reason we do that is because high definition or high resolution uh, digital sickness doesn't thrive really well outside the box, meaning that if you want to transfer high-res data from one place to another, you have to go through maybe a USB, uh, and that means that you actually have to convert uh, the I2Square that you have from the screen to USB and then back to I2Square so you can do a DA conversion. So those two conversions we completely avoid by putting it into one box. Um, the sonic benefits are huge by, by the, the sonic degradation of having to do these conversion is actually quite big. So by avoiding those, you get a sonic benefit from having it in one box. Um, yeah, it's uh, a novel type of DA conversion we have in there. Um, and it actually made me very happy when we, when we first started listening to this because we were listening to some very old files and all of a sudden we got this analog sense of feeling that uh, everything comes from below and plays with energy and, and tonal color uh, from the deeper space and up rather than uh, the digital sound signature and everything sort of points at you and come from above. So my, my take on that is that the, the A to D process is very, very good, whereas the D to A process is still in development. We are not quite done yet to get all the potential out of the digital storage, that digital stored music we have. Um, that seems to be at a very, very high level. Uh, even the early uh, uh, A to D conversions in, from the 80s uh, has a huge amount of detail and, and, and music that we have not heard yet. And I think one reason why the uh, digital to analog process is in a way flawed is because it's, it's, it's a, a discrete process. It, uh, it is uh, point by point, and then you write a value to a register that then sets a resistor in a resistor letter, and that gets you a signal out, an analog signal out. And the problem with that is that every time you have a, 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 that point is, is a switch. And a switching is a ramp up time, it's a, it's a ripple uh, when it's open. And, and by that you, in the process, add some high frequency noise that you then have to deal with later on. And I think that is very difficult. Here in the 880, we do this as a continuum instead, meaning that we oversample the signal so much that we get to 22 megahertz. And then we have a, a summation circuit that we, then we look at, a, at, at an interval. Uh, and, and, and that means that we, we don't have a pointed process anymore. We have a continuum moving, looking at a time interval. And that means that once the bit value changes, we get a sort of a reflection into that. So it's incrementally ramping up to the next signal level rather than stepping up to it. And I think that makes a huge uh, difference. And it makes the digital uh, source material sound analog in its way because we essentially we process it as, as analog. You can look at it a little bit like a uh, 16 bit uh, value uh, treated as a DSD 512. Um, it's a tremendously uh, high potential for resolution. It's a tremendously 
high potential for low noise because we look at these inter time intervals rather than the discrete points. I, I think for me that was at least a, a sort of a, like a sonic revolution into digital where we get the same sense that we have only had with a, a good turntable or a reel-to-reel -reel deck. Okay, uh, I still have my eye infection. <laughs> well, anyway, we have uh, different products in the 880 series. We also have an integrated uh, uh, 200 watt Class A amplifier. Uh, we also have that as a, as a purely a power amplifier with 50 watts more. And, and Class A and amplifiers, I think I should start already there saying, talking about what is Class A. Class A is when the output devices are not switching. Class A, B. Um, most manufacturers say they make an amplifier, a 200 watt Class A, B. But there's nothing Class A or Class B. It's a little bit like being pregnant. Either you are pregnant or you're not pregnant. Either you're Class A or you're Class B. There's nothing in between those two layers. And the primary objective here on, on the 880 uh, integrated amplifier is to avoid the switching altogether. Uh, switching is not a product of how hot you run your output devices. Often Class A has been associated with something with big cooling fins and uh, a lot of heat and a lot of excess power. And that is uh, the case if you want to bias your output transistors so hot that they never switch. But what if you could just keep them biased instead of... The, the, the problem is that output devices in, in bipolar transistors has a leakage that runs current through the base to the emitter to the signal. And because of that, when they start conducting, that base leak gets bigger. And that tends to deplete the voltage in the driver stage to a level where it can no longer sustain the, uh, keep the bases open and keep the transistors conducting. So when the current is running in the bias through the transistor, less is running to keep the spread. And what we have done is that we have been looking at this and see is, are there any way else we can keep the spread? And what we have done is that actually most of the heat in the amplifier is because we take a lot of current in the, in the bias circuit. 150 milliamps as opposed to 12, 15 milliamps. And that gives us 10, more, 10 times more current there to draw from in, in, into the output transistors. Um, and then most of this voltage spread we made with a diode instead of with a resistor. And a diode is much less prone to change in size when it has less current. It doesn't shrink in the voltage a whole lot. It just keeps the same voltage there stable. So that little bit of extra current that we need or extra voltage that we need, we create with a resistor. And that makes it possible for us to have an output device, an output stage that never switches into class B. Uh, I think it's fundamental if you want to call something class A that it's not switching. And we have been working on that for the last I think I've been working on that circuit for 15 years before we actually succeeded in making it and see that what we predict in our spies is also what we get in the real world. There are other differences in our amplifiers that is not so common is that we use for the main power supply resonant mode power supplies rather than a big uh, toroidal. Uh, toroidal for me is a thing of the past. I mean, that's like, uh, at least in Norway, everybody drives an electric car. I mean, you don't have uh, big transformer stations in the power electronics anymore. You use inverters. These, uh, that uh, you have the wires going above the ground and in every small little village there's this transformer station. It doesn't happen anymore because there are so much better ways of, of doing that uh, voltage conversion. And a resonant mode power supply has that ability that allows you to shock power 400,000 times a second rather than 50 times a second when the voltage is just up on your, your curves. Um, so you have much less pollution from 
diode bridges switching on and off and filling big uh, capacitor reservoirs. This shakes the whole amplifier. So the sonic benefits of uh, having a resonant mode power supply is just unbelievable. Actually, if you look at it from an objective point of view, uh, ion, uh, toroidal or eco transformers should be a thing of the past because you cannot uh, put that on the grid. It's not simply are not allowed, so you cannot get amplifiers approved with big uh, transformers anymore. But that is just a side effect. The real benefits is the sonic benefits of using resonant mode power supplies, which are by far more silent. You have, instead of dealing with the ripple from the diode switching on in the volts, you have milli and micro volts you have to deal with. Um, I think I think that uh, sonically, um, sonically, class A is uh, the, the the superior concept, while you have the class D approaching very fast. Uh, but still, the main advantage of class A is that you don't need any filters on the output, so you can avoid a little output filtering. Uh, a little induction, so it gets this a little tighter grip, a little more detail coming through, and a little more um, um, masculine power from below, so to speak, compared to, to class D. And that's why it's still worth it to go there. Um, the, the disadvantage or the, the, the cravat of class, uh, designing class A is that you have to work with old devices because the uh, last time you put out new transistors was late late 80s. A uh, bipolar transistor complementary pair was late 80s. So we work with relics, but still they are sort of like the sublime, uh, sublime way of, 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 uh, of making uh, amplifier circuits, the class A, compared to the, to the, to the class D. I, I want to start a little earlier than the Tesla coil. I will put the Tesla coil on, uh, but I will start actually talking about uh, cables, cables in general, and, and specifically mains cables or speaker wires, where you have actually a transmission of current. And, and, and there may be skeptics out there say that uh, a cable is just a cable. And of course they're right, because they can all transmit current, they can all connect things. But there's a huge difference in how cables perform. And the differences shine through in, in many aspects. And as a general rule, you can say, if you want to make a good cable, make sure the inductance is very low. Uh, make sure the capacitance is very low. And the, maybe the most important part of that is make sure that the cable is just really, really shitty antenna. The problem with a cable in a certain length is that it's also a, an ideal antenna for picking up uh, certain radio frequencies and create electromagnetic resonances within itself. And, and that signal it picks up as an antenna, your amplifier, your electronics have to deal with as well. And, and because that is a high frequency uh, signal, that then there should be only very little capacitance between windings in transformers or distance between PCB traces for that to bleed in. So every time you, you attach a cable to a product, you also attach, attach an antenna. And we see that a lot because when we go down and try to approve our products, we can connect one cable and it fails, we can connect another cable that's better and works less as an antenna and it does not fail anymore. So it's very uh, important for for hi-fi products to have a cable attached that is a very poor antenna. Now, how do you make the cable a poor antenna? <laughs> that, that is sort of like uh, the underlying question all the time. And the best way of doing that is make sure that it's, it, it, it has uh, maybe not a specific length, but maybe different lengths. Or maybe if you're even better at it, make it so that it has no length at all. Um, it's, it's like if, if, you, if you look at it, if you then take a, a, a ball and bounce it off the wall and it comes back to you. But if that wall was not 
really a wall, but a hole that got smaller and smaller and smaller, you will get no balls bouncing back to you. And that's essentially what we try to do uh, in our cables, to make them so that they are very poor antennas. And we can do that in, in different ways. We have a, a number of different tools. We have, uh, we have some resonators, uh, we call them, that builds into the cable where, where a part of the cable is, is attached. Uh, and on our higher series, that's the part from the box to the connector. That part contains of many different lengths of cables. Some is just the length it is, some is twice the length and three times the length, and some is uh, maybe five, six of the length, and then you make them and then you twist them back. And all of that sort of put a break or makes it impossible for a standing wave to be in the cable. And if you just make it two length, then at least you already there take the fundamental and reduce the possibility of that to half or get the half of the amplitude. And every time you do something more, you can even decrease the amplitude of the antenna effect even more. So that's one thing. And another thing is that we have uh, something we call uh, here a Tesla coil. And uh, it should actually be called a reverse Tesla coil. And the idea of that is that you make so a coil uh, which with high frequency is a small electromagnet. But inside that you make another coil wound in the opposite direction, meaning that it's an opposite e electromagnet. And those two, what happens is that when the current goes in or the voltage go into the first part, it creates an electromagnetic field that then induces a current in the inner core of it in the opposite direction. And what we have seen that is that by doing that we actually cancel noise spikes about 20 maybe 15, 20 percent, and that is a, a lot of noise reduction you get from that. So, so I, I think that the, the function of cables is of course to supply uh, the electronics with the needed power or your speakers with the need, needed power, but it should do the so in a, a non-intrusive way. Uh, we see this uh, effect of antennas many places in the uh, electronic chain, and that's why we have a number of different products addressing each point. Now, you cannot make an amplifier without connectors. You need to have, you can attach a CD player or any other line source to it, so you have connectors. And these metal parts sticking out the back are also ideal antennas. And there we also have something which is based on a Tesla coil, which will cancel the, the antenna effect of that connector by adding these plugs to it. So, so uh, cables are different, have different structures, different materials, mechanical properties and all that affects the sound as well. So, so, so cables, uh, for us, we try to make them as sonically invisible and that we do by, by, by reducing noise, reducing the ability to be an antenna, reducing the filtering from having very low inductance, reducing the mechanical effect uh, by having very stable materials. If you have good mechanical materials, the problem with the cable is that it transmits current and that creates noise, that creates a, a repellent and contractions between the, the ground and the signal wire. You have sometimes current running in that direction, that direction, and that puts sort of like a spring into that. So if you have a rubbery material, your conductors will vibrate. And that vibration generates actually current. So you overlay the current that is supposed to go there with the mechanical current from these micro vibrations. And that you can also hear. So good mechanics, Low inductions, low capacitance, and very poor antenna. That's a, the basic things that we design our, our products after.